That's dangerous. Our merciful Father and gracious Lord, we come to you once again asking for grace and mercy to be with us. As we study the topic of the sanctuary, Lord, we ask that you would open our minds, our eyes, most of all, our hearts, to receive the truth that you have to reveal to us today. Father, once again, we know that it is sin that has separated us from you and that you spared nothing in your attempt to redeem us to your son. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. And we ask for blessings and mercy in his name. Amen. This evening, I wanted to discuss the sanctuary. One of the things that God brought to my knowledge, my understanding as a Christian in a relationship with him was the sanctuary. It was the one thing that I didn't understand. But I submit to you today that it was the one thing the Jewish nation failed to understand in its fullness. I want us to begin in Exodus chapter 25. And we're going to read Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 40. The word of God says... And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I have shown thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and after the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Verse 40, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was shown thee in the mount. There is no doubt, there is no question that the sanctuary truth is one of the most prized truths that was given to the Adventist church. Would you agree? It is the one truth that no other church that I know of is preaching to the world effectively. However, the sanctuary is the single jaw-dropping structure that gives indisputable evidence not only in favor of Adventism but points to true religion. We need to know without a shadow of a doubt what the plan of salvation is and what this structure means for our relationship with God. In the sanctuary, this is what we could find. These are the truths that we can find. Number one, who is God? Can everyone say amen? Who is God is very important to us. Because if we don't know who God is, we cannot get past the first commandment in the law. Number two, what is truth? Number three, how we know. And number four, where we are in time. In Amos chapter three and verse seven, Amos chapter three and verse seven, this is what the Lord says to us. Surely the Lord God will do what? Nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. I submit to you today that the sanctuary is a revelation of the secrets of God.
In Psalms chapter 77 and verse 13, the psalmist says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God? I'm going to read to you something here. This is Manuscript 8, 1914, paragraph 32. And I want you to pay attention to what the words say regarding this subject. In Manuscript 8, this is what it says. We cannot find words fitly to explain the latest development of ideas held by some. They contain threads of pantheism. Can someone tell me what pantheism is? Amen. That God is in all, isn't it? These ideas are so mixed with the truth that the truth is made of no effect. These specious theories constitute a denial of the personality of God, the atonement of Christ, and his work in the sanctuary. They take away the vital principles which have made us a separate people. Why do you think pantheism is connected with the sanctuary? Why do you think those two things are in the same sentence? Is it because the sanctuary is the single structure that eliminates the idea of pantheism? It has to be. It has to be. In the book, Christ in His Sanctuary, I'm reading from page 16 to 18, paragraph 1. Listen to what it says. And there is a warning that comes with it. It says this. The sanctuary is the blueprint. The very plan of salvation and remittance of sin, which is meant to show law, order, justice, and judgment. In the future, right? Obviously, in the future, from the time that this was written. In the future, deception of every kind is to arise. And we want solid ground. For our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. The enemy will bring in false theories, such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. Where shall we find safety? unless it be in the truths that the Lord has been giving for the last 50 years. Now notice this. They, the children of God, will not by their words and acts lead anyone to doubt in regard to the distinct personality of God or in regards to the sanctuary and its ministry. Once again, I want you to notice that the personality of God is tied to the sanctuary and its ministry. There is a reason. We all need to keep the subject of the sanctuary in mind. Who is all? Every last one of us. To every last one of us, the sanctuary is of vital importance. Our knowledge and understanding of the sanctuary is of vital importance. God forbid that the clatter of words coming from human lips 
should lessen the belief of our people in the truth that there is a sanctuary in heaven and that a pattern of this sanctuary was once built on this earth. God desires his people to become familiar with this pattern, keeping ever before their minds the heavenly sanctuary where God is all and in all. We must keep our minds braced by prayer and a study of God's word that we might grasp these truths. How important is the sanctuary? I want to paint a picture for you. I'm going to give you two parallels. The sanctuary on earth and the sanctuary in heaven. And these two parallels will give us a glimpse into the reason why the prophet connects the personality of God with our understanding of the sanctuary. Let's go now to the great controversy. We're going to the Great Controversy, the 1888 version, page 677, and we're going to read paragraph 2 and paragraph 3. And I want you to pay attention. I'm going to highlight some key words by enunciating more fully when I get there in these two paragraphs. In the Great Controversy, she says this, All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe, and rang with song, songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransom with unutterable delight the children of earth enter into the joy and wisdom the unfalling beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through eternal ages in contemplation of God's Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of his power displayed. Now, once again, let's picture this for a moment. We have the throne of God in the center of all things. And then we have all creation circling this throne. Are you with me? Now, let's go to the book of Psalms. In Psalms chapter 19, we're going to read verse 1 and 2. And there's something that we need to see. This world that was given to us was to show us of the world unseen. How many of us know that? God? has given us the Bible, but he has given us nature as our what? Second lesson book, right? This is what the psalmist David says. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Once again, do me a favor, and I want you to stick with me, because what we're going to learn tonight is very important. You have the throne of God, and then around the throne, all of creation in its appointed order. There's something that we need to know about this throne. Let's go to Patriarchs and Prophets, 
page 36, and we're going to read paragraph 2. Most of us are familiar with this. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, paragraph 2. Was the Father alone on this throne? No. This is what it says. It says the Son of God shared the Father's throne. And the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. Now listen. Around the throne gathered the holy angels. A vast, unnumbered, remember that, unnumbered throng. 10,000 times 10,000, the most exalted angels as ministers and subjects, remember that, rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the deity. Now, I don't want you to forget everything that I told you to remember, so let's move quickly. Numbers chapter 2, verse 2. I want you to now, now we have our first picture. We have our first picture of the heavenly. We have the Father and the Son sitting upon the throne and all of creation circling this throne. However, just about the throne, we have a vast, unnumbered throng of holy angels who serve as ministers and subjects. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 2 and verse 2. In Numbers chapter 2 and verse 2, this is what it says. Regarding the children of Israel and regarding the tent of meeting, which was their mobile sanctuary. It says the children of Israel are to camp, each one by his banner, beside the sign of his father's house. Let them camp what? Far off about the tabernacle. So, we had the tent of meeting, and then around the tent of meeting, you had what? The camps of Israel. Right? From the heavenly picture, we see the throne and all of creation. From the earthly picture, we see the sanctuary and what? The children of Israel. Now, there was a special group among the children of Israel who were surrounding the tent of meeting before you got to the tribes. How many of us know who that special group was? The Levites, right? Let's go to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1, we're going to read verse 47. To 53. And I want you to picture the Levites much like the angels. Because there's a parallel. Watch this. But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered. Right? We see in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says the angels were a vast, unnumbered throng around the throne. Now, in the earthly, we see the Levites were an unnumbered throng around the sanctuary. Are we seeing the parallel? For the Lord God had spoken unto Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel. But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the table tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof and they shall minister unto it and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. So as the angels were ministers and subjects around the throne in heaven, so were the Levites ministers and subjects around the tabernacle on earth. Do we see that? Now, 
Now listen to what it says in verse 51. And when the tabernacle set it forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. How many of us know that the Bible talks in Ezekiel about a mobile throne of God? Who is transporting this mobile throne? The angels. Are we seeing the connection between the Levites and the angels? Let's continue. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, every man by his own standard throughout their host. So were the ch children of Israel in their appointed order? Absolutely. Now, if this is not clear to you, Christ in his sanctuary, page 38, paragraph 1. This is what it says. Speaking of the tabernacle, it says the building was divided into two apartments. How many? Two apartments. Please remember that. By a rich and beautiful curtain or veil suspended from gold-plated pillars. And a symbol, similar veil closed the entrance of the first apartment. These, like the inner coverings, which formed the ceiling, were of the most gorgeous colors, blue, purple, and scarlet, beautifully arranged while inwrought with threads of gold and silver were cherubim to represent the angelic host who are connected with the work of the heavenly sanctuary and who are ministering spirits to the people of God on earth. Do we see the connection between the heavenly and the earthly? In the earthly sanctuary, there were two places that were closed off in dedicated areas. The first one was what? The holy place. The second one being what? the most holy place. Now, I want us to get this picture because we need to know what these two apartments represent. Let's go to Exodus chapter 25. In Exodus chapter 25, we're going to go to verse 23. where we're going to see the first article of furniture in the holy place. Stick with me. And thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold and make thereunto a crown of gold round about it. Let's stop right there. How many of us know what gold represents? What does gold represent, Brother Kevin? Faith, right? Faith and purity. Remember, most of the instruments in the tabernacle, save the seven-branch candlestick, was overlaid with gold. It was made of wood first, then overlaid with gold. How valuable is wood? Wood is, is not valuable. But how valuable is gold? Very valuable. The sanctuary was made in a way where God showed our puny effort being represented by the wood, and his purity being represented by the gold. So the wood and gold came together to make these astounding instruments that made up the sanctuary. Humanity and divinity co-working. 
And thou shalt make unto it a border of an handbreadth round about it. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. Let's skip down <clears throat> to verse 30. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. I know we have some, some Bible students in here, so I'll ask the question. What does the table of showbread represent? The word of God. The throne of God. And the bread represents the Father and the Son. In John chapter 16, verse or John chapter 6, verse 32, listen to what Jesus says. Right? How many of us know? And I, I, I need everybody's hand to go up. How many of us know that our salvation is through Christ and through Christ alone? John chapter 6, verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but who? But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, What? I am the bread of life. But let us remember, just like uh, Brother Sammy said, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Christ is a representation, the main representation in that table of showbread. In him was life, and him, in him was life enough for every children in the tribes of Israel. Amen? Let's go on to the second instrument. What's the next one that we come to? The candlestick. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 31 and 37, let's read about the candlestick. And thou shalt make a candlestick of what? Why pure gold? <laughs> Amen. Because there is no light that man can manufacture. God is light, and in him dwelleth no darkness. Is there darkness in man? Man cannot be a part of this candlestick. His shaft and his branches, his bowls and his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. The seven-branch candlestick, just imagine it being illuminated in the sanctuary. A sanctuary where everything is overlaid with pure gold. Oh, what a dazzling sight that must have been. Jesus spake in John chapter 8, verse 12. Once again, John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says this. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, What? I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If there was anyone that the seven-branch candlestick represented, who was it? Jesus Christ. Our final article in that holy place is the altar of incense. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Now we go back to the wood, right? The wood is, is, is a factor in this instrument. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lambs, he shall burn incense upon it. What was the need for the incense? Say it again. The incense represented the prayers of the saints. But let me tell you something. The incense was also because every single day 
you and I would have to go to that sanctuary and shed the blood of the lamb, and the blood was sprinkled all throughout that place. Can you imagine the stench? So not only is it our effort, but it's mingled with the sacrifice of Christ and presented before the Father. Amen. In the devotional, The Faith I Live By, this is what it says. Page 196, paragraph 4. God expressly directed that every offering presented for the service of the sanctuary should be without blemish. Only an offering without blemish could be a symbol of his perfect purity, who was to offer himself as a lamb without blemish and without spot. How many of us know that not only did those sacrifices and offerings represent Christ, but it represented the saints who would make sacrifices just as Christ did? You had grain. You had drink. You had things that represented economy and everything that man could sacrifice to God. Not just the lamb. Notice what Paul says. In 1 Peter 1.19, the apostle points to these sacrifices and as an illustration of what the followers of Christ are to become. Right? Are we not to walk in the footsteps of Christ? So just as he made sacrifices, it is well for us to do so as well. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now think about this. How much sacrifice is required of us? Let me ask you, how much did God give? He gave all. He gave all. Think about this. The Father gave all power and authority to his Son. Everything that was made was made by him and for him. Brothers and sisters, do you know if Christ failed in his redemption for man, all would have been lost? All would have been lost because all was given to Christ. God gave all for us. In the Review and Herald, we're reading from September 4th, 1883, paragraphs 3 and 4. Listen, please. Listen. Satan employs every means which he can devise to overthrow the followers of Christ. With marvelous skill and cunning, he adapts his temptations to the peculiar temperament of each. Believe me, he knows you better than you know yourself. Those who are naturally selfish and covetous, he, he often tempts by throwing prosperity in their way. He knows that if they do not overcome their natural temperament, the love of mammon will cause them to stumble and fall. His object is often accomplished. Did she say frequently? Yes. Often accomplished. 
when the riches of the world are offered them, many eagerly grasp the treasure and think they are wonderfully prospered. The strong love of the world soon swallows up the love of the truth. The approval of God is sacrifice. What are we supposed to be sacrificing? But she says the approval of God is sacrifice to secure the favor of his enemies. Wow. Mm. If those who are thus prospered would lay what? All their possessions upon the altar of God, they might overcome their selfish, covetous spirit. And so thwart the design of Satan. How much are we to give to God? All. All of it. However, let me tell you this. None of our sacrifices would be acceptable to God without the mingling of the righteousness of Christ. There we have the altar of incense. We already said this, but let's go here. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, tells us what this golden altar represents. And I saw another angel came down and stood at the altar having a gold censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. Which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the hand, of the, out of the angel's hand. Once again, all of our righteousnesses are like Filthy rags. Isaiah tells us that, right? Therefore, it is imperative that we employ Christ on our behalf. Now, we read in Psalms 77 that David said, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. We read also that Sister White says that there's going to be an attack on the sanctuary. Right? We also read that the personality of God is connected to the sanctuary and its truth. Right? In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Right? So let me ask you this. If there was one being that the holy place represented, who would it be? Christ. Remember, how many apartments are there? If there is one being that represented the most holy place, who would it be? The Father. Let me tell you. There is going to be an attack on the sanctuary because the sanctuary is the single structure that proves that we must have a relationship with the Son in order to reach the Father. This is something that the children of Israel then and today are failing to realize. Practical godliness as spelled out by the sanctuary. Now, as we close, this is what I want to bring to you. I want to bring to you a greater understanding of the sanctuary. Because it's well that we keep this in our mind. For the attack will come. In the life of the sinner, there is a path that he must take. 
We read earlier that the sanctuary is the blueprint, right? The sinner comes to the sanctuary, and the first thing that he must do is confess that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That brings us to the first article of furniture. After that confession and realization, what must the sinner do then? He must then outwardly profess to the world by baptism that he is in a relationship with Christ. And once those two things have happened, he is ready to then enter in to a relationship with Christ, which brings him to the holy place. In the holy place, the sinner then turns to the table of showbread and receives the bread, which is the word of God. And from that word of God, he is also to receive light. That light then shows him the darkness which is within himself, which should bring him to his knees in prayer. Have you followed me to the altar of incense? And then after that process has been completed, then the way to the Father is made. Then the veil that separates man and God is no longer there. It was still there for the Jews because they lacked understanding. But for you and I, we have understanding. That this is the process we must take to get to God. Let me ask you this. Was there any way to get to the most holy without first going through the holy? No way. If any priest would have attempted that, he would have dropped dead immediately. After completing that process is then we are revealed before God, mingled with the righteousness of Christ. You remember, the blood was poured upon the mercy seat, right? And we're going to get to this in another message, but what does that blood represent being poured on the mercy seat? That's our lives, hidden Christ, and Christ himself interceding for us. Mercy. Understand, there's going to be an attack on the sanctuary because the sanctuary points to two things. The Holy One and the Most Holy One. And our relationship that needs to be sustained from one to the other. It would be well for us to remember, consider the sanctuary and what it means to us in our daily life. And walk that path, the blueprint that has been given to us. Understand this. It was only the priests who were allowed to do this service. But here's what God has told us. He has made us kings and priests. In a personal way, we are to walk through that sanctuary, professing to the world, not only the world, but the church, who is still behind the veil, that this is the way to life. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. 
our Father and our God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, you have given us such an extraordinary view of truth. Not only truth, but truth as it is in Jesus. You have revealed to us these things by your word. And all of this truth is ours. Taking. But Father, let this not be in vain. Let this. But it that leads to transformation. We desire more of your saving grace in our life, and we know that Son is before the throne of God, interceding on our behalf. Oh God, help us to lay all upon the altar of sacrifice, that we may be fully exposed to our God, and that He may cover us the righteousness of Christ. Father, this is our earnest prayer in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.